Mexico is has the task to build a better, healthier future for people all over the world, and particularly also to assist countries to improve public health systems that meet the needs of disadvantaged populations, and that is particularly the case uh, for, for rabies that we are facing. And uh, WHO is also supposed to provide technical guidance that would assist countries uh, and, and catalyze uh, capacity, capacity building. So currently there is a lot of things happening. Luckily this morning we talked already a little bit uh, about some aspects, so I will be uh, short on that. So, again, we deal with a neglected disease, but luckily this is a vaccine-preventable disease, and there is now a global goal established to reach zero human death from dog-mediated rabies by 2030, and this is aligned also within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. So this global strategic plan will be explained in more detail by our colleague Gregorio Torres tomorrow. So I'm not saying more about that. And I jump directly into all the technical guidelines that came up or are shortly for being completed uh, from the WHO side. And many of those are also in collaboration, be it with uh, collaborating centers from WHO, international experts, and of course, the other international organizations involved <coughs> in rabies elimination. This is just a snapshot of the key uh, guidelines which are under elaboration or just uh, being done on the, where is the <coughs> yep. So on the, hey, which side? this side. Sorry about technical. So Gregorio will talk about the strategic plan. Um, I will focus a little bit on the update of WHO's immunization position. We heard already a lot and we were talking this morning about this platform for rabies data and it is my particular pleasure to let you know also that a report or the third report of the WHO expert consultation is just published. It contains many useful things for countries. Another important update that will be soon available is the laboratory techniques uh, for, for rabies. And the last thing I will touch on quickly because it's relevant to some of the countries and it triggers a global attention more advocacy around rabies is the potential investment of Gavi into human rabies vaccines. Let's jump directly into the rabies, human rabies immunization policy issues. So this was the first time ever uh, that there was a rabies working group established under the strategic advisory group of experts on immunization, which is a high-level committee at WHO of experts. They worked very hard, this group of international experts, over more than a year, and they had the task to come up with, to consider new evidence available, because there has been so much published since the last time, 2010, when the immunization policy was published. But with particular emphasis to be practical and feasibility for rabies endemic countries. So that means also, is there a possibility to reduce the duration of post-exposure prophylaxis regimens? And how can we improve the situation for professionally, occupationally exposed people like dog vaccinators? And how we, can we cope best with the frequently occurring uh, shortages and stockouts of vaccines and rabies immunoglobulins, and last but not least, very important to ministries of health, what is the most cost-effective way to deal with all this? So this is just an example of cost-effectiveness to show you. So we had, we established from WHO 
uh, modeling consortium on rabies, also renowned international experts. We gave them certain tasks to look at different post-exposure regimens. We looked at forecasting. We looked at settings where you have uh, a limited amount of vaccine or rabies immunoglobulin available. What is the best practice that is safe and, and uh, saving lives? Uh, if how many people can you treat? How many deaths can you prevent? So I don't go into details. This is just to show you that uh, it was not <laughs> just publications and expert opinion. It was an uh, extended uh, group of, of, of people working on all those questions. Again, uh, this is a snapshot of the new regimens that are now recommended by WHO, which are, were evaluated based on several criteria by the experts. So on one hand, of course, is this uh, regimen uh, immunogenic? Uh, does it provide for sufficient immune response that we can measure uh, to be safe, to save lives? But also, is it practical and feasible for people uh, in terms of duration and number of visits required or numbers of injections required per visit. Um, cost effectiveness, uh, is it less expensive than the current uh, schedules? And this includes not just costs for the vaccine, but also cost for people to get to the health facility, for example, and the loss in wages because or they have to absent themselves several times from work, etc. You, you're not expected to read this in detail. You have a full publication where you can dig out what you need. Just one little uh, remark. There are no changes for regimens that concern people who already had either a pre-exposure prophylaxis or had a post-exposure prophylaxis earlier in their life. In a snapshot, what is interesting to you and what is not really written in the document published, this is just an example to compare the before and after. So what is the former position of 2010? <coughs> and what is it now? And how does it change? And you will see that there is a considerable um, reduction in duration of the entire post-exposure prophylaxis regimen. It's not here on the slide, but the same applies for the pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is now down to one week. You have considerable vaccine savings alone, 20% uh, already by, uh, by, by reducing one session. And there was also very convincing data on changing the mode of administration of RIG, which can be also, and RIG is very expensive and hardly available uh, in rabies endemic settings. And so this is a considerable change because depending on the setting, <coughs> you use more than uh, 40%, you're up to 40% less volume of this very expensive biologic. The other thing is there was a discrepancy between the WHO gold standard recommendations and the realities, particularly in highly rabies endemic settings, where biologics are very difficult to obtain and where the gold standard of um, a category three exposure and requirements for rabies immunoglobulins couldn't, hardly could be met. So the experts also looked into options to prioritize patients for rig allocation if its availability is not given or very little. And this can lead also to up to 90% reduction in terms of this very 
expensive component of post-exposure prophylaxis. Let me show you, these are the documents that are readily available. You have here the link. You can also go on the rabies webpage of, of, of WHO. Uh, this is just a summary with the key changes and a bit nicer to read with graphics, infographics. And this is the new full text publication of the WHO position. It's available online. Let me switch to the next topic because my time is limited. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the third report of the WHO rabies expert consultation. I have several people in this room who were participants of this consultation, notably uh, Dr. Del Rio, we have Hervé Bourri, we have, uh, no, you, you were there too, yes, Fl Florence Cliquet, um, who, Gregorio, Garg, uh, so there were many people there and this is a very good document because it provides complementary information that goes far beyond immunization. It provides updates to the epidemiology of rabies in the world. It provides guidelines for palliative care of rabies pa patients with emphasis on resource limited settings where you don't have intensive care with all possible um, luxury. Uh, what is the most ethical way to deal with these people who are terminally ill from, from, from rabies? Then um, also methods to reduce uh, the, the, or to prevent overuse of scarce human biologicals rabies uh, vaccine or, or rig. So there is more than just the immunization <coughs> policy, but we talked this morning also about integrated bite case management and a bit more in-depth risk assessments that could help the countries to reduce the number of post-exposure prophylaxis given to people without compromising on safety. Then uh, all around animal rabies control as well. And um, last but not least also, WHO is proposing a process for countries to validate uh, zero human rabies deaths so that human rabies mediated by dogs is no longer a public health. Um, problem. So that's kind of the intermediate step before you go to OIE to declare a <coughs> rabies-free status. So this means that you still have a little bit of probably dog rabies or wildlife rabies, but your systems, both the veterinary and the public health systems, managed to reduce the number of human deaths to improvement of the system. So all this is available also online. Uh, uh, you can check with this and of course, as, the, as OIE is also updating their standards, we did that in close collaboration and kind of in a phased approach together. So there will not be two different, completely different standards. It's a harmonizing process on the global level. We talked also about data, and I think I don't need to spend much more time on this. I told you we have work in progress also at WHO. You had now an introduction to uh, the, the rabies bulletin of GARC. And you see on the, this is just a screenshot on the left side. So it will <coughs> look very similar what you just saw in the workshop. and. We are working, it's my last slide, we're, uh, we're working on, on uh, connecting between the organizations and facilitate data and exchange. I know I have one more, the Gavi learning agenda, maybe I can shorten that. So Gavi is a, is a big organism in charge of procuring and facilitating access of least developed countries to uh, childhood immunization vaccines and additional vaccines. 
And rabies is one of the candidates, so they have a few, every few years they have a, a vaccine investment strategy where they evaluate new candidates. And WHO, together with the Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute, did some in-depth studies to assist this uh, decision-making with additional data. You see the map um, here. Additionally, we looked into how are countries actually procuring, distributing, and deliver uh, rabies vaccines because there are big unknowns, and it's the first time someone ever looked into that, and that's about 24 countries. Uh, would be interesting to do the same <coughs> also for dog vaccines to some extent. And that triggers quite a lot of <coughs> activities, uh, advocacy um, around rabies beyond just these few countries and has been very helpful also for the global strategy development and many other activities. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.